Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another live edition of Miked Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. We have reached the end of the high school basketball season, but that means AAU is just around the corner. And in one way, shape, or form, chances are you have seen our guest for this edition, Azaria Jackson Sherrod, a graduate of Benilde St. Margaret's and Emory University in Atlanta, and over the last few years has worked as an official, including some state tournament games this past week. Azaria, thanks for coming on. And I have to ask you, what do you make of this journey of going from player in high school, high school player, college player, and making your way to an official? I know a lot of referees who I've met had that path as players themselves, and it's a way for them to stay involved. But to be a part of that as a prep athlete and a college athlete, and now you get to earn a, or you get to have a front row seat in a way to the next mm -hmm. generation. What do you make of it? Because I have to imagine, even though uh, your job isn't to care about who wins, that has to be a pretty cool feeling to see mm -hmm. so much talent up close and personal. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on, Mike. Um, yeah, exactly what you said. It's great to see the talent up close and personal. And honestly, I get paid to watch basketball, which is great because the ladies and the boys that I've repped, I've seen some stuff I haven't seen as a player. And to be able to see it as a ref is truly a blessing. And from what you were telling me beforehand, I have to wonder, do any of these players give you that itch to suit up again? You're telling me about some local rec leagues you take part of. And I'm wondering, do any of these players that you see uh, inspire you to get back out there? No. And, and it's funny because I did that, that rec league last night and I was gassed when I came home. My chest was hurting. Player shape is a lot different than ref shape. Because ref shape, you at least can walk a little bit, kind of slide, and you run when you have to. But player shape, you basically have to run all the time. So having done that game last night, no. I am fine being a ref. I am fine being the bad guy most of the time because I get to see uh, these ladies and these young men go out there and suit up and give it their all. Fair enough. I wouldn't put you as a bad guy, though. I mean, <laughs> I I know what you mean, and I've been there. Unfortunately, I was at a game today where a fan was escorted out because he got a little unruly and threw a water bottle that hit a radio crew that was broadcasting okay. uh, the game that I was covering. So I know what you mean, and I tell folks all the time when they suit up as officials, I'll let you know how I feel about calls one way or the other, but I don't take it personally. Like, all right, right. I may, I'll let you know if I agree or disagree and that's fine. I feel there's room to do that professionally, but mm -hmm. no, I would never consider you a bad guy though. <laughs> At least someone thinks that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know a little bit about your background, so I think yeah. that helps. And I say this all the time in the games I cover that the players, and I guess I would extend it to yourself. You were a former player that mm -hmm. everyone you see is going to be more than what their stat line or record says. Right. And if I do recognize officials, sometimes I will just say a biographical thing about them that I may not even have anything to do with basketball. Just a reminder that, Hey, everyone you see is more than just some robot that goes out and works games, yeah. but yeah. Yep. Uh, I will agree with you. It is pretty nice to get paid to cover basketball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I do want to state, since we're on the subject, for anyone listening, I've had officials on before. And as I understand it, you can't discuss games that you've worked, but that's not why we're here. I'm not interested in relitigating all the games and you've done so many right. that it's probably all a blur to you anyway. So yeah. if anyone watching this or on Facebook Live or they go back and listen to it. That's not what we're here for. Uh, but Azaria, before you suited up as an official, mm -hmm. you were a player. Yeah. In fact, not just any old player. You dropped over 1,500 points at Adult St. Margaret's, and your name is on the banner of 1,000 point scores. 
Mm -hmm. And when I go over there to the Haven Center and look at some of the names mm -hmm. on that list, it's a pretty impressive one. Olivia Olson is up there, of course, and mm -hmm. Kashin Alexander, uh, who was a fantastic athlete at Iowa, coach for a long time. There's a few others whose names are a bit fuzzy. <laughs> when you do this as long as I have, that's what happens. But mm -hmm. What gave you that first itch as a player? What inspired you to get out there and play? I've been playing since I was, what, five years old. It was just a sport that I loved. And I consider myself a basketball junkie. I always have basketball on. Uh, so it was just, I just love the sport and love being out there. So I played in high school and continued on in college just because I loved it so much. I can't remember how I got started. I think it was just my mom signing me up with the rec league. But ever since I started, I just loved it. And after playing, I wanted to stay around the game. So with basketball always being on in your household, <laughs> do you recall your first memory? or why the sport attracted you being a basketball junkie what was it about the sport where if you weren't playing it you were watching it yeah I think I just get so fascinated because other sports it's kind of one-dimensional you know football you can run fast you can tackle someone you can catch the ball score a touchdown throw a touchdown whereas basketball there's so many different ways to play it and there's so many different ways to be good at it. You don't necessarily have to be the quickest one on the court. You don't have to be the strongest one on the court. So I think just being able to play it in different ways and be good in different ways is what attracted me to it and what kept me in the game. So with all the basketball you took part in as a youngster, Mm -hmm. Who were your idols? And this could be anybody. Were there any players or personalities that you watched and said, this is who I want to be? I wouldn't necessarily say I watched them in terms of thinking this is who I want to be, but I definitely, definitely looked up to Candace Parker. I was a huge Candace Parker fan and uh, I loved Tennessee. And then I also loved watching Stanford, the Gumake sisters way back then Candace Wiggins I don't know oh, people watching may not know that name um, but I used to love watching her at Stanford so those are just a few that stick out on the men's side Kevin Garnett you know the hometown hero um, and I remember going to the games watching him watching Spreewell but the big ones definitely Candace Parker Candace Wiggins and then the Aguma K sisters well, I do recognize Candace Wiggins. I interviewed her a few times. In fact, all of them I interviewed when I was a WNBA beat writer and I still have that itch. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping to get back there <laughs> one day, but that's a pretty good assortment. And right, I wasn't meaning specifically like, oh, you wanted to be just like Candace Parker, but yeah. what was it about their games? Because the Aguma case, Candace Parker, I think a lot of women's basketball fans would remember them. Stanford fans, of course, remembering Candace Wiggins, and then she won a championship here at Minnesota. What was it about their games that made a resounding impression on you? I think just their grit. Um, one thing about Candace Parker that I will never forget, uh, I think it was 2008 when Tennessee played Stanford for the championship, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was way back in the day, but Candace Parker literally played with a back brace. I remember she had on a long sleeve uh, white shirt to cover up her back brace and she still dropped maybe 20. So I think just their grit because they weren't, I mean, Candace Parker was one of the taller ones, but someone like Candace Wigging, she wasn't the tallest one, but just their grit as a player. And they kept playing despite not being the quickest or not being the tallest or having a back brace on. So I have to ask you, Azaria, because a couple of them have started broadcasting careers now, as you know, with Candace Parker mm -hmm. involved in Warner Brothers Discovery, the NBA broadcasts, and 
March Madness, Shanae Gumake doing the same at ESPN. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could be in your future? I've never thought about that. That hasn't come across my mind, um, but I do enjoy watching them commentate. They're very smart, have a high basketball IQ. So I do like watching them commentate. Well, Azaria, if you ever get that feeling or want to try it out, I'll keep a spot open for you. Okay, thank you. Now, it might be a while before we get another basketball game because uh, the season just wrapped up and AAU, we don't cover it the same way most of the time. But if you ever wanted to give it a try, I've had some players, well, former players and some officials come on too, and we always have a blast with it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'd like to think your IQ is up there. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. <laughs> so over time, as you developed your craft in the sport of basketball, what led you to enroll at Benilde St. Margaret's? And what do you recall from your time as a member of the Red Knights? Mm -hmm. uh, so I remember when I was in elementary school, I actually went to Meadowbrook, which is a Hopkins school district. Um, but my mom wanted me to get a good education. So that's why I ended up at Benilde. And honestly, I had a lot of fun at Benilde. I remember when I was in eighth grade, that was when we made it to state. And at that time I played on JV and they had pulled up some players from JV to come along for state. And it was just fun to, I didn't play, but I didn't care. I was at state having a good time. and being able to be a spectator like everyone else, but having a front row seat. Uh, so I had some really, really good time, some good times at Benel, had some fun teammates, fun games. So that's definitely what I remember being a Red Knight. I remember that as well, making them making mm -hmm. state that is. They won it all in 2010. Yeah. I think they got back there the following year. Yeah. Oh, I can't remember all the players. I think Olivia Antilla, Josie yeah. Dillon are a couple. Yeah. And I'd have to dig a little bit deeper. And if I'm correct, your coach was Bob Lyons. Yep. Before, uh, well, now Tim Ellison took over and mm -hmm. uh, did pretty well yeah. his first year there. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I know we're kind of jumping around, but I recalled one of your Instagram posts highlighting the full circle moment, getting to officiate at Benilde St. Margaret's. And again, it goes back to, as an official, it's not your job to care about who wins. You're not there to root for one team over another. Uh, but how surreal was that to get a game? I don't know how assignments work. I think yeah. you get them from a central from authority. Yeah, yeah, from an assigner. There, there's someone who handles the assignments, right? Yep. You don't pick per se. But yeah. when you saw that, oh, I'm going to go to Benel St. Margaret's, that had to have been a feeling and experience. Yeah, it was, oh my gosh, it was so fun. And it's just, like you said, a surreal moment. And then it's funny because every time, I don't have a lot of games at Benel, but I'll have maybe one, one or two a season. And it's just like a homecoming because you know the people who are working the table, you know, people who are in the stands. So it's just really cool. And it's, and it's nice for them to see your progression because they, you know, they know me as the former student, but it's kind of like, what are you doing now in life? And for them to see a part of that is really, really cool. So as a student, as you made your way through the ranks, got more playing time and became an accomplished athlete yourself, uh, how do you feel you grew and you developed as a player? Like you said, you know, you weren't playing any minutes in your first mm -hmm. year, but you didn't care. You got to experience the state tournament ride. Mm -hmm. And I have to wonder, how did that fuel you as a player? Because once you got out there, as we saw, you, you, you weren't so... Yeah, you weren't too shabby yourself over 1500 points that's about 1500 more than I got <laughs> yeah I think once you get a taste of it it's kind of like you want more so just that that feeling when you're out there that's what mainly fueled me is because I it's this feeling of I want to experience more of this so then when you're out of the season then you're putting in that work whether it's in the weight room on the court to experience that feeling over and over again. 
Looking back on that, what would you say were your fondest memories or moments that you were glad you got to be a part of? Because I can't recall. I don't think you won state mm -hmm. as a player, but you did get to participate in the All-Star Series and you, know, you, you left an impact that maybe doesn't get the headlines like Asheen Alexander or Olivia Olsen have who won state titles, but as you noted, staffers still recognize you and your name is going to be up at that banner for the remainder of time. Right. Yeah, I would say, and you're talking about as a Red Knight, correct? Yeah, just what do you recall yeah. from your time as an athlete at Benel St. Margaret's or what you look back on most fondly about yeah. that experience? Yeah, I would say definitely going to state was one of my fondest memories, just being to be getting to be a part of it and, of course, missing school. Um, and then I definitely remember... A lot of times after our Friday games, we would go to the the Perkins over there in Edina. I remember that. That was definitely a fond memory, and that was fun to have that team bonding. Uh, another one I would say is one year we actually played Duluth East, and because it was so far, we stayed in a hotel, and we had some really good team bonding. And I remember at that time, the the girls' hockey team was playing, and when we were eating, we were watching the girls hockey team because they were at state. I think I'm pretty sure. Yeah, they were at state at that time. So I remember that. And then, of course, the the all star game was really fun just to be able to play with play with people who you usually play against and be on a team with them. So I had a really good time with that, too. All right, Azaria, now you, you, you lit a match under me. I'm like, I have to figure out who did you play with? Uh, because. Uh, those events are always fun. Uh, it was always a highlight for me getting to cover uh, those all-star events because, like you say, it is one of those things where you get to mix it up. And I think with AAU uh, as part of that mix, um, Surprise. everyone kind of knows everybody anyway. Uh, but you all get to go out with that swan song. And, oh, I'm looking back on on that. Anna Schmidt from Waconia, she was part of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think just from your class, uh, Lindsay Maleka from Hill Murray. Uh, there was a Allie Green, I think, from Adamidi. Yeah. You, yeah, just in your class, there were some pretty uh, notable names there. Yeah, all those names. Uh, I remember Anna went D2, and then the other two went D1. So everyone made an impact wherever they went. What do you recall from that part of being a high school athlete in relation to the college experience? Because I know you went to Emory, which is a Division three school in Atlanta. So what was the recruiting process like for you? And what led you to go to this Division three school yeah. all the way in the Southeast? Yeah. So actually, funny enough, I actually wasn't recruited by Emory. I, if you, in technical terms, I was a, a walk-on. I was recruited by other schools that are in the conference. So U Chicago and Carnegie Mellon. So I was looking there first. But at the time, the, so those are really, really high academic schools and at the time, U Chicago, their acceptance rate was 8%. And Carnegie Mellon, I think maybe 20%, something like that. And so I actually didn't end up getting into the school because with D3, they don't have, you know how in D1, you may not have the academics, but you can still get in through athletics. Well, for D3, it's not that way. You still have to get into the school on your own merit. So... I originally was looking at U Chicago and then that didn't pan out. So I was looking at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon and that didn't pan out. And actually I had a AAU tournament in Atlanta. And I remember driving on the highway and my mom was like, oh, Emory, you should apply there. I had never heard of the school because I'm a lot of people up here in Minnesota haven't heard of Emory unless you've been in Atlanta. So I was like, okay, I'll apply. So I applied, didn't know anything about the school, didn't know any, uh, didn't know about it being a high academic school. And then I ended up getting in. 
So I got in and it was, I got in first and then I reached out to the coach at the time and they had an admitted students day. So I went down to Atlanta for the admitted students day, but then I also coordinated it to where I could meet the coach. Cause I had sent her my highlight tape and I had coordinated to meet her, meet the assistant coach, meet the team. And then I got to play with the team. So I end up having a walk on spot and that's how it all happened. I'd like to think uh, things worked out as it was intended, so to speak. So yeah. you were a biology major at Emory, if I'm correct. I was a human health major. Human health. Okay. Mm -hmm. Human health. This is why I asked, because I don't like <laughs> to assume. Otherwise, I could have would have gone on this long winded trail about biology that had nothing to do <laughs> with what you wanted. Uh, but not knowing anything about the school and then getting accepted and getting an opportunity to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. How do you think that helped you grow and mature when your first two options didn't work out and not because you were talking about the acceptance rates for those schools? So it's not like uh, you weren't good enough, per se. It's just the schools you noted are just tough to get into. Uh, how do you think going outside that area to this place you hadn't heard of, how do you think that helped you grow both as a student and as an athlete? Yeah, I would say being at Emory, because I hadn't spent much time in the South and the culture is totally different. So being at Emory exposed me to that. And then I was able to develop my character because of what, what I was exposed to, especially different uh, trials and tribulations I experienced as a student, because Emory is a tough school as well. And even though I played D3, it's still, you're still putting in a lot of work. So going through that, I was able to kind of go through those moments of fire and then come out of it and have that ad adversity and ultimately be stronger because of that adversity. And you carved a pretty good niche at Emory. You were a starter your last two years there and picked up a few points along the way and a few other uh, accolades as well. And what you said, I think, summarizes D2 or D3, where it's intensive, maybe not at the same level as Division I, mm -hmm. certainly not the publicity, at least in a place like Atlanta. I, I liken mm -hmm. that to some of the D3 schools around here in St. Catherine and Hamlin. But how do you think you took a step forward as an athlete at Emory. And even if you didn't get the pomp and circumstance that might've come going to a division one school in that area or division two, et cetera, how do you think that experience as a division three athlete at Emory benefited you? Oh, I would say a lot because as an athlete, even though it's D3, you're still going through that same, well, maybe not the, as long as the D1 athletes, you know, their practices are a lot longer than ours, but you're still going through that grit. And I remember when I first came in, I was not ready. I thought I was ready, but we went through those workouts and I, I just was not ready. So after having that first year, I knew in the summer what I needed to do in order to be ready the next season. And I wasn't very confident coming in just because I was lacking in the, the workout department with weightlifting and making the times for our sprints. But I knew what I had to do to fix that. And ultimately that made me a better athlete. And what would you say you took away the most, the one thing or multiple things that you feel you carried over from Emory as you made your way from Atlanta to here. You talked about getting to experience a different culture down in Atlanta. And I've been there a couple of times. There are some differences from the Twin Cities, but I don't regret visiting there. I always enjoy going out of it. Mm -hmm. What do you remember from your time as an Emory athlete once you figured out what was required of you to make an impact? Yeah, I would say... I remember putting in the extra work outside of outside of the season 
and that work paying off because like you said, I didn't start my freshman year. I didn't start my sophomore year, even though I came in when we started games, I was playing a little bit and I made a huge impact, but that was kind of taken away just because we got into more difficult games and I wasn't experienced, but I would say just continuing to believe in yourself and stick at it because you're not going to see, some people see results right away. Well, I didn't see results right away. I kept kind of hacking away and hacking away and then seeing my results later on. And throughout your time as a high school athlete or college athlete, you touched on this a little bit, getting to connect and meet a lot of other players out there. Mm -hmm. Who were your teammates that you felt inspired you to reach that next level, whether it was at Benel St. Margaret's or at Emory, because I think you played alongside Grace Coughlin for a time yeah. and some yeah. of the other teammates you had in high school, I'm drawing a blank because your high school days were several years ago. Yeah. And when you cover 50, 60 games a year, like I do now, when 9,000 stations all want you to announce their games, I can't mm -hmm. remember everybody, uh, right. but who were some players that inspired you to continue this path yeah you definitely name one grace for sure just because she worked so hard and she had injuries but she still worked hard and gave it her all when she was out there on the court another one from high school i definitely would say um was khadija shumpert i don't know if you remember that name um but she yeah she worked really really hard and i looked up to her and actually um, I was having communication with her when I was still in college because at one point I was considering possibly playing overseas and it didn't, didn't end up panning out. But um, just for her and going all the way to New Mexico and doing what she did. And then uh, I don't remember if she, I think she did for a little bit play overseas, but um, she was another one that I looked up to. And then at Emory, was there a player who took on a similar role? And I asked because I can't say I, I have much knowledge about D3 or who plays mm -hmm. and all of that. But uh, as you got acclimated to a completely new environment, I'm guessing not too many Minnesota kids oh, no. <laughs> went, go down there, especially to play yeah. D3 basketball. Uh, but who are the players that again, helped inspire you or even just helped you feel at home while you were thousands of miles away? Yeah, I would say um, a player who definitely helped me feel at home was Lauren Weems. Uh, we still talk to this day and we'll check up on each other, but she was someone I felt like I could go to just because I was so out of my comfort zone and there wasn't anyone from Minnesota. So definitely her for sure. We touched on this a little bit in terms of getting acclimated, but what do you recall from that transition? And I guess what are some things that maybe you took with you or maybe some surprises you learned about getting to see what Atlanta is like? Uh, like I said, I've been there a couple of times and I know a lot of uh, a, a lot of my peers or contemporaries enjoyed that spot because of the opportunities it presents compared to some other cities mm -hmm. and you look at the number of things there are to do down there. Uh, but yeah. what were some takeaways you had and maybe some things that surprised you getting a taste of Atlanta and what they're about? Yeah, I would say just how diverse Atlanta is and especially my school um, there were Southeast Asian kids, there were, you had African, you had foreign exchange students coming from Asia, it just, it was just so diverse. And in Minnesota, there are certain pockets that are diverse, but in general, uh, it's just not as diverse as Atlanta. So that was definitely something that was very surprising for me. Um, something I took away is just that going through basketball and 
just, I think knowing that I'm stronger than what I think I am, just because you're experiencing a lot of adversity and it's a new transition in life where first time leaving home and being on your own. So that definitely was something I took away. And Atlanta, I think brought that confidence out of me because kind of toward the end of my college career, I just felt more confident than I was coming in. And yet you were crazy enough to come back up here and put up with all of our <laughs> snow. Actually, we we joke about the snowy weather we sometimes get. I don't know if you went through this, but in Atlanta and the southern cities, one or two inches, it doesn't take much. It will shut down the entire city. Yes, we did go through that. It probably happened one time a winter. I think when I was there, it maybe happened twice. But it's so funny because up here we're used to it and we have the equipment to deal with it. Whereas down there, they don't. So the whole city just shuts down and you go to the grocery store, everything's out of stock because people think it's an apocalypse going on. So yeah, it's very, very different. <laughs> and I bet in moments like that, as everyone else uh, panics or isn't sure what to do with themselves, it, it, there's a I'm not saying you uh, took delight in their suffering, but there might have been a part of you that said, oh, you rookies, yeah. <laughs> this is for nothing. Sure. For sure. <laughs> so you got your degree in human health. Mm -hmm. And then what led you to come back here? And along the way, because I think, yeah, you graduated in 2015. Mm hmm from high so, school. Yeah, right. And then college four years later, I presume 2019. So mm -hmm. I think if I remember your first season of officiating came during the COVID year, maybe it was before, yeah. but I know this is yeah, a, year. a new thing. So what led you to come back here and what ignited this journey into officiating mm -hmm. and getting back into the sport that gave you so much? Yeah. So uh, so I was a human health major, nutrition minor at Emory, and then I ended up getting my master's in nutrition. So that's actually what led me to come back here because I went to the U for a few years to get my master's. And officiating, so I, a lot of people don't know this, I actually was officiating while I was playing in college, but I was doing intramurals. And so I did flag football, volleyball, and basketball. And when I got to my senior year and I was doing basketball, they call it the, the referee bug. I just was like, oh, I really like this. I want to do this for, for real games. And so I remember talking to my mom about it. And my mom said to me, you should sign up for the high school league because you're coming back to Minnesota. You should sign up for the Minnesota State High School League. So I did. And I remember I was doing a, it was so literally out the blue um, I was doing a lift and workout. And then I remember getting a call from Jason Nickleby because I think I had filled out a form or something. And he called me and told me about officiating. And then I ended up um, getting linked with Carolyn Dirksen. I don't know if you've had her on, but I, she's a former player now an official. Uh, she doesn't do high school anymore, but she's on the college side. And she told me about a camp here in Minnesota. And a camp is basically, for anyone who wants to be an official, a camp is basically how you get hired. So I went to that camp and that was how I got hired and the rest is history. And your first season came in the COVID year. So uh, not a whole lot of normalcy compared to the last couple of seasons, but do you remember the first game you officiated? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go and and I'm guessing it's different going from intramurals yeah. to even the high school level and college level. You've done some uh, small college games as well. Uh, but what do you remember from that first game? And were there any similarities that you might have experienced the first time? Maybe you suited up for Benilde St. Margaret's or at Emory. With the... I'm just curious what the similarities yeah. and differences are um, when you go through that first time experience again. Yeah. So I don't remember my first intramural game, but I definitely remember my first official game with the Minnesota State High School League. It was at Blake and it was a freshman game. And I just remember getting there and um, I had went to some camps that summer. So I kind of knew 
uh, like how to look because you want to have an official look. So I was making sure my, you know, my jersey's tucked in, my pants look okay. Um, but I was so nervous just because when you're an official, it's so different when you're a player versus when you're an official, because when you're a player, you make mistakes, but it's just not as, it's just not perceived as big as when you're an official and you make mistakes just because it's like you make a mistake and you can move on versus when you're an official, you can make a mistake and it can change the entire outcome of the game. So um, I just remember being so nervous. And I think that would be the similarity to when I first suited up for Benil, just being really nervous and then getting out there. And I remember my mechanics weren't the best. They were okay, but they just weren't where they are now. And uh, so, yeah, I was just super, super nervous. I'm sure a lot of others out there would feel the same way you do. And, and I think you summed it up perfectly as area. There's a microscope mm -hmm. because even during some state tournament games on my social media feeds, I'll see posts from others and I won't, I'm not going to single them out. Cause again, that's not why we're here mm -hmm. talking about, Oh, how the refs uh, have it for one team over another. And it's like, Okay, you know, everyone might have a different interpretation of uh, like a 50-50 call, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but like you were saying earlier, you're under the microscope more yeah. so than the players are. Mm -hmm. uh, was there anything that uh, working games now that you picked up on in terms of what you go through and all of the items you have to monitor? you have to keep an eye on 10 players at any given time. And you're, you're not by yourself. Of course you have partners that help you out, but working as an official, like you have these last few years, I imagine you picked up some things that as a player, maybe you didn't recognize not because you were ignorant or oblivious, yeah. but because you didn't have to worry about it. Right. Right. Uh, definitely certain rules. I won't go into detail, but rules where I thought as a player, it was one way, but then as an official and you've got the rule book and it's this other way. So definitely certain rules. And then honestly, I would say the main thing I picked up being an official is how to communicate with people because you're always having to talk to people and people are questioning your calls. And then you have to explain that. Whereas as a player, you're just playing. You don't, you communicate with your teammates, but other than that, you're just kind of out there playing. But that would be the biggest thing is how to talk to people. And on that subject is area. I've seen you several times at games. That's what led to this, actually, this podcast, because again, even if I don't remember everyone's name right away, there's that mental note and I'm like wait I remember you from this and, then, mm -hmm. and it's crazy how much that has grown on my end I've been calling games for 17 years and mm -hmm. uh, a few people have introduced themselves when I met them for the first time they're like oh yeah we watch your games on YouTube or I remember when you covered me in a game and I'm like did really did I do that like <laughs> and I have to go back um but you and I, we've been on, well, again, not on the same team, but we've crossed paths at a lot of games, mm -hmm. a, a few that were fun to cover as a broadcaster, but I imagine maybe a little more intense as an official because you have mm -hmm. to stay focused and not lose sight of things. But on the subject of communication, how do you handle it when you deal with coaches or players or parents that might turn combative you know you you don't want them of course I think there's going to be some leeway about calls because I imagine as a player you went through the same thing mm -hmm. I don't re remember you as a player that would jaw at anybody of course but I imagine as a player you're probably like oh shucks or right. really <laughs> this is a foul <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah right. how do you handle that as an official when sometimes you get the peak of someone else's agitation yeah so well first off parents 
we just ignore anyone in the stands we just ignore and if it becomes an issue then we'll just have the site people take care of that but in terms of players and coaches honestly if you just approach them in a mild mannered way and talk to them usually they'll calm down but if they don't then that's it's kind of you can agree to disagree and walk away um, you can also use your toolkit of giving warnings if it warrants giving technicals I'm someone who's not very quick to do that I like to talk to people first and to at least get them to kind of be at a, a lower temp, temp um lower temper so I usually yeah I just approach it very mild and a lot of times if they see that you're approaching it that way then they'll calm down too because sometimes when they see that you're agitated too then they kind of want to turn it up a little bit more but not always um so if you approach them mild and just talk to them like they're people because again like you said we're not robots out there and neither are the coaches neither are the players so if you talk to them like they're human then usually they'll be pretty receptive but again not always what have you learned in terms of creating that shell like you said ignoring the parents which is I'd say a a pretty good strategy uh, mm-hmm. because you know they have nothing to do with the game as far as its outcome. Uh, but how do you think that has learned? Or how, blah, blah, learn? How do you think? What do you think being an official has taught you about well, weathering key to moments like that? Because, like you were saying, it's something you may have to deal with from game to game you have a way of going about it. And the other people who I've had on who have both coached and officiated have said as officials, you know, we're not looking to tee anybody up. That's not something we, if you're going in there to do that, then you're officiating for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what do you feel is the best strategy for others who consider this assignment to handle that kind of criticism when it comes at you and in all its shapes and forms. Yeah, so usually um, with that, and I'll just swap, talk specifically to coaches, is um, if they have questions, don't ignore them. Answer those questions. Um, if they have comments, then that's something you can kind of bypass unless they have a question along with the comment. But definitely, if they're having questions about things, don't ignore it and address it. Be direct. Don't be around the bush or anything. Just say, coach, this is what I saw. Or you could say, coach, you know, you're if you saw it that way, then I missed it because we're human. We make mistakes. But I would say own up if you made a mistake on a call and just say, you know what, coach, I miss that. Or if you if the coach doesn't agree with something and you are 100 percent sure that you have the call right, just say, coach, this is what I saw. And that's why I called it that way. But definitely be direct. And you talked about your first game being a freshman level game. Mm -hmm. And in a short span of time, that's turned into working state tournament games, as you got to do this past week Mm -hmm. over at Gangelhoff. And I remember seeing you at the Region 13 tournaments at Anoka Ramsey. So Mm -hmm. you're working small colleges, too. Mm-hmm. what do you think that signals about how much you've learned in this facet of the game and in a short amount of time you went from working games with capacity limits and everyone had to wear masks now of course everyone had to go through that with the pandemic but you start off at freshman level being a nervous wreck as you described it <laughs> and now you're working your way up, getting a chance to officiate high school games and working the small college circuit. I don't know where this path will lead you, but mm-hmm. I'd like to think you've made quite a bit of progress. If I'm seeing you at Anoka Ramsey and at high school games and at state tournaments, like if I'm not careful, you're going to become a household name before too long. You're going to pass <laughs> me. 
So yeah, what was what was the question? Just, just how do you feel you've grown or matured in that process where you started small? Yeah. And I think every official does. Mm-hmm. Now, in just three years, here you are working state tournaments, region tournaments. It, it it's I don't know how far the chain goes, but I'd like to think you progressed at a pretty good clip. Yeah, I would say um, how I feel I've grown. I've definitely gotten a lot better with that communication piece because it's easier for me to say it now versus when I was starting out, just because I feel like that's the hardest part of refing is having to talk to people. Uh, so I've definitely grown in that as- aspect. Um, if we're thinking about textbook things, I would say definitely gotten better with being in the right position for calls and being able to see it better and judge if it's a foul, if it's not, if it's a travel, if it's not. Um, But of course we miss some. Um, And then also being able to work with other people because you're working with, you don't get to pick, it's not like football where you have the same crew the entire season. You're working with different people every night. And so I've definitely grown in that aspect to be able to work with other people and ultimately be the best team out there. Cause we're a team too. You've got, you got one team, you got the home, you got the visitors, and then you've got the referees plus the table. That's another team. So being able to work with other people and then work with the table crew as well. We talked about, the players you looked up to when you were an athlete that inspired you. Since you joined the ranks of officiating, who would you say have been your mentors? Uh, Because I've gotten to know several of them over the years myself, and usually I'll say some fun nugget about them. And my apologies, I'm going to name some names just so people can understand what I'm talking about. But Lonnie Anderson, who I call the historian, because Mm -hmm. he's always digging up old videos of high school games long before we had huddle and YouTube and Mm -hmm. 10,000 ways of streaming it, uh, a way to document the history of the game. Uh, Lamar Sullivan, I've gotten to know him over the years and he's always checking out games. Matt Olive, who has a few 300 bowling games in his repertoire. So I often say whenever I do a game that he officiates, I tell folks all the time, if you're running a bowling league and you need a ringer, Matt's your guy. And then uh, <laughs> Crystal Flint, I met her as an official all these years ago, and we've kept in touch since then. So those are a few of the people who I've befriended through this. And I'm wondering, who are your mentors as you made your way through the ranks? Yeah, I would say, uh, like I mentioned before, Carolyn Dirksen. Uh, she definitely, I don't know if you've talk with her at all but she definitely helped me get started with Minnesota and with high school league so she definitely is a mentor and I've texted her before and asked questions just because I'm still pretty early on in my career and I don't know I don't know everything and especially the logistical stuff Um, I also would say James Patterson he's been a big one we'll talk on the phone we'll text and then he's also helped me with logistical stuff as well. So I would say those main two. Well, I haven't met Carolyn yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if this interview makes its way to her and maybe we connect and do something down the road. So something tells me uh, if I haven't heard of her yet, maybe I will uh, because uh, I keep doing high school games and I learned this. Actually, it was Crystal who indirectly showed this to me at an early age Mm -hmm. in my broadcasting career, that is that when you come out there and cover games and do the broadcast presentation, everyone takes notice, including officials. And so I'm always happy to send copies of uh, the games I cover (coughs) to officials like yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, And some have even asked me, Hey, can we get the video? or Where can we find it? Because they want to do film reviews. So Mm -hmm. Always happy to help out there. We address this a bit, but considering the stories that we hear about 
the difficulties in finding officials at times. And you, you probably have seen some of the stories that mm -hmm. get out there in terms of the combativeness that you sometimes have to deal with. Uh, for others who are considering doing what you're doing and looking at being an official to put on the resume, et cetera, what advice would you offer to anyone out there who is either thinking about signing up next season or looking at this as a long-term option, what advice or feedback would you offer based on what you've experienced so far? Yeah, I the first thing I would say is stick with it because that first year is the hardest because you're doing those lower level games and people may not know the rules. You may have parents on the side but definitely stick with it because it gets easier the higher up you go because you have better play, people know the rules, the players know the game, um, but definitely stick with it because that first year is the hardest. You've got screaming parents, maybe screaming coaches, and it's easy to say, you know what, I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. There's too much yelling, um, but just stick with it. Uh, I would say trust yourself for sure. And um, also making sure that you're doing stuff outside of just showing up for the games. Um, one of the biggest things that have helped me has been networking, going to different camps, um, meeting other officials, asking other officials about different things. So build a little network of officials that can help you along that way and kind of can understand what you're going through. So stick with it. Definitely have a a small network of officials that can help you and um, trust yourself. And a couple more thoughts I wanted to run by you related to this subject. You and I, we've been talking a lot about games that we've covered this season, just as mm -hmm. basketball fans. I don't have the playing background that you did, but people have told me that I do know what I'm talking about, as hard as that might be to believe. I, even if I didn't have the traditional experience, there are some things I'm able to gather. But I'm not asking you to pick favorites here because, again, as an official, <laughs> you have to be even keel. But what do you make getting a chance to see this next generation of athletes? You got to work a couple section finals, a couple state tournament games, and you're out and about, I'm out and about. So what would you have to say about this crop of athletes compared to when you were playing and what they're doing to put a spotlight on Minnesota basketball? Yeah. I mean, this new generation, they have so much talent and basketball in general has just expanded in terms of styles of play and different moves that you see. So it's just really fun to just see different parts of the game that I didn't necessarily see when I was growing up, like the Euro step, for, for example. I mean, I was practicing that, but that wasn't something that was super common when I was playing, but now it's becoming a lot more prevalent. So it's just been super fun to be able to see this talent. And people are definitely putting a name for Minnesota uh, just because you got those NBA guys, you got Chet Holmgren. Um, I'm blanking on his first name, but last name Roddy played at Breck. You got Jericho Sims playing for the Knicks. And then on the women's side, assuming Paige goes to the WNBA. Assuming. <laughs> <laughs> assuming is there. Yeah, she'll be going. She'll be going. <laughs> the other way she's not going to go there is if uh, her, her legs fall off or something. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen, by the way. No. <laughs> No, but and Caitlin yes. Clark is going to be right behind her. Yes, yes. But yeah, I mean, they're really putting Minnesota on the map. I literally was watching a game, an uh, NBA game the other day, and I heard the commentator say, Minnesota's got some great basketball players. And this was Stan Van Gundy, I think it was, who said that. And for him, way, I think he was maybe covering, I don't know what game he was covering, but for him to say that about Minnesota, that's just great. So, um, it's just awesome to see these players. And one thing I like as an official 
is seeing people who you refed when they were younger, maybe playing JV, AAU, and then they move on to varsity, then they move on to college, then they move on to pros. And as an official, that's just super, super cool to see. I have to wonder, Azaria, like you mentioned running into some familiar faces. Has that ever happened? Well, me, but I, I, I don't know if I'm up there on that list, but when you go to games and folks are like, hey, you look familiar. Yeah, actually, I had that happen this season. I had refed an Anoka Ramsey game, and I was just standing there for, for warm-ups at the half, and uh, a player, one of the players for Anoka Ramsey came up to me, and she goes, oh, you refed my high school game. And I didn't remember her, so I said, what school? And she told me the school. And then when she said that, I remembered her right away. And I was like, oh, yes, I do remember that. So, yes, that has happened. It hasn't happened. I don't think it's – well, I've repped – I have repped coaches that I played for. So that has happened. And they're like – That has hey. to be something. <laughs> yeah. They're like, hey, you're, you're a rep now? Uh, and that even happened on the college level, the D3 college level that happened. I'm like, oh, you got our game tonight? Cool. So yes, that has happened. I'll tell you this is area. One of my broadcast partners, and I don't know if you go back and watch the games we do, but Latoya uh, is one of them. And uh, she knows you well, at least as an official. She's seen you around and she's like, yeah, keep an eye on this woman. She's going to be going places, if I remember our conversation correctly. So it's hard to argue against her. We've called a lot of games together in six years, so mm -hmm. I'll take her word for it. But I know some of the <laughs> women's players that come to mind. Well, one of your fellow Red Knights, Olivia Olson, she's going to Michigan. Now, I know you didn't play with her. Mm -hmm. You're a few years older, but like, how can I not mention her name? Mm -hmm. And then I don't know if you've done any Providence games yet, but Madden Greenway, and then yep, I, I had her when she was in seventh grade so <laughs> honestly seeing her progression in that short amount of time because I remember how she was as a, as a player in seventh grade and she she's busted the lead or the <laughs> high school lead wide open oh and she was leading her team in scoring that year and steals oh, I think yeah I, I made a note last week uh, in my preview podcast or I should say the one that I taped with Eric Bugard over a junior all-star. And I said the two, a tournament has three athletes who are the fastest players ever to score 2000 career points. Mm -hmm. How crazy is that? And yeah. they're in one tournament and we're going to see them for at least a couple more years. So mm -hmm. yeah, what Madden is doing. <laughs> she led the state in scoring and assists as a freshman. And I, I don't want to, pin anyone as the next page Beckers because I don't feel that would be fair to any of them but <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if Madden becomes the next household name mm -hmm. out of Minnesota with what she's accomplished already and if you don't mind though going back a bit who are some of the toughest players you had to go against because I remember how much you enjoyed the all-star series because you got to mix it up with players that normally uh wouldn't be on your team. So who were the players that really made you test your medal? And I don't want to say questioned your desire for basketball, but the players that really challenged you as an athlete, who were the toughest players you had to face? Yeah. So being at Benelde, our rival um, was De La Salle because they were the other um, religious school that was close by. They still have a rivalry series. Oh, you do have a rivalry well, series. Well, those two schools. Yeah. Yeah, so they they meet every year as part of a rivalry. Yep. That's what. It, yep. So they 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 still meet up. Um, oh yeah, yep, yep. They were doing that when I was in high school. So definitely some players over there like um, Tyshana Johnson, uh, Alina Starr. Um, they were some tough ones to play against. Um, obviously, you have the Hopkins players. You got T.T. Starks, Raya Livingston. Um, trying to think who else oh we would play Eden Prairie too um I'm blanking on her last name but her first name was Martha but I'm blanking on her her last name um but I I remember playing against Eden Prairie when I was a kid so I literally was playing against those same people when I was in high school and it's like they know your game the best because 
you've been playing against them for years and years and you kind of have to come with new weapons because they know how, how you're comfortable playing and their job is to make you uncomfortable. So uh, those are just a few. Uh, Lindsay Maleko is definitely one for Hill Murray just because she had that, that grit and that toughness and she was going to hustle after everything. So having to keep up with her in a game, that was tough. So those are just a few. <clears throat> Olivia Graskowitz, uh, that was another Hill Murray athlete. Okay. I think if my if I remember names correctly. And then when you brought up Tyshana Johnson and Alina Starr, like they were the dynamic duo at De La Salle yeah. when yeah. they won three in a row mm -hmm. in 3A. And Hopkins, T.T. Starks, I think she's at UConn now as a graduate assistant. Her mother uh, putting some accolades of her own as a high school coach now at Hopkins. And of course, uh, another player, I'm sure you remember going against her, but when you mention some of the others, I'm like, that's right. You probably went against Nia Holly too. Yep. At she, Hopkins. Yep. She was a year younger than me. We didn't play Hopkins too much. Um, but I would say the, those other two who are in my class, that was more on the AAU circuit. Um, okay. Well, it didn't matter what class <laughs> Hopkins yeah. had that pipeline for so long that yeah. like, <laughs> they were going to bring it to you. Yeah. Uh, so now watching games with your experience as a player as a, and, and as an official, when you go and attend games as a spectator or watch them on television, whether it's a tournament, do you find yourself creeping into that officiating mode or are you able to separate yeah. those identities? I'm just curious because I know when I watch games, I've gotten better at this, but for a time I would start getting into play-by-play -play mode. And then I'd have to say, Mike, you don't have to work. You don't have to worry about any of this. Just watch the game. <laughs> What is it like for you? I know it's one thing for players to watch games and talk about it, but you have the experience as an official now. So yeah. what is that like when you're going to those state tournament games you spoke of earlier or watching games from home? Yeah, I would say when I went to the state tournament games, I definitely was, I was mainly a fan, but there were some things like the officiating does creep in and you kind of think, if an official calls something one way and you don't agree with it, then you kind of think in your mind, I would have called it this way. But then again, it's such a different game when you're on the court versus being a spectator in the stand. In the stands, you have the best view. You can see every angle. When you're official, you're eye level and you have to create the best angle. Uh, and then as far as watching officials on TV, one thing um, I have to keep in mind is that different levels have different rules and people don't know that like the rules in college are different from the rules in high school. The rules in college are different than the rules in the NBA or the WNBA. So I try not to get into rules, but I just, I do find myself um, when it comes to play calling in terms of foul travels and stuff like that but I know travels are a little bit different in the NBA um and kind of thinking I would have called it this way but then again like I said you got the best seat in the house you're on the couch you got replay you can see it in slow motion whereas when you're on the floor it's real time and you got to make that decision right then and there so I do try to keep that in mind when I am watching in the stands or watching at home on the couch and in your case, there's no review, not at the high school level or yeah. the small yeah. colleges that you've done. So mm -hmm. you can't go back and right. you know, things happen. And I say this all the time, and I think the best coaches sum it up this way too. No one play decides the game. So right. even if right. you make a mistake, I like you said earlier, it's easy to make officials the bad guy because you know, they're the yeah. ones that they don't have any skin in the game per se. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say, and I mention this all the time, no matter the sport, I have to give them props. I know volleyball is one where I don't know how they keep up with that sometimes and how the ball <laughs> goes around as quick as it does, mm -hmm. but the same for basketball, because I, I don't know if I'd have the mental fortitude mm -hmm. to do it because of all the flack you sometimes get 
uh, just because you're doing your job. Right. And, and like you acknowledged it, some of that comes with the territory because you're not there to worry about who wins. Mm -hmm. uh, and drawing a blank for a second here, but you're not worried about who wins, but you're there to make sure that things are done in proper fashion and mm -hmm. all of that. Where do you see yourself on this path as area? Is this uh, something that is an addition or, to what you're doing with your day job? Or do you see yourself potentially going from high school, small colleges to perhaps moving up that ladder to D2 or D1 pro? Who knows? But you've gotten a taste of it. And I can tell you've enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Even in the moments where things aren't so bright mm -hmm. in terms of calls or fan reaction, et cetera, where do you see yourself on this path? Yeah, so right now it's definitely something that's in addition to the day job. But um, honestly, I'm happy wherever I go, whether that's D2, D1, professional, um, but just kind of continuing to expose myself and going to those camps and clinics and hopefully getting hired at higher levels. So definitely, I don't think a uh, small college is the end. I think, I think it will be a, a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> well, give it time and Flex that networking prowess of yours is area. And I have a feeling of we might see you scale up that ladder. I looked, I saw a tweet. I think it was another sport. Mm -hmm. But one thing that another colleague of mine who still officiates from time to time when he's not working as the athletic director of his school is that especially if you're able to move up the chain, you can make some serious money uh, doing this. And again, you're not going to get uh, the glitz or the glamour, but that's not why you do it. So you know, if you stayed the course, uh, who knows? Uh, you could forge a nice little path for yourself in this career track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. So there are a few things that I like to ask of all my guests, area on this podcast. And in your case, uh, I'm curious to see how this answer might have changed. So I'll frame it this way, because I understand that several years ago, when you were a high school athlete at Benel St. Margaret's, that you were one of the best beatboxers around. Is that still true? Uh, I haven't done that in so long. I don't even know if I still have it or not. <laughs> Well, what happened there? I, I I would have loved to have seen this beatboxing deal of yours. So what happened? Well, you got your you got two degrees, your bachelor's and your master's. So I think we'll just say we'll just put you know what, that's what, what that explanation. It's so funny because in college I, I I did some beatboxing. We had a remix to Wheels on the Bus, and it was me. Um actually the the coach our um, she was our assistant at the time and eventually became the head coach. And then another teammate of mine, we would do like a, a wheels on the bus remix. And yeah. <laughs> Is there a version of that anywhere that I could find? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I actually was just, I was sent that video maybe a few <laughs> weeks ago. I don't even remember what I was sent it through by, by the coach, um, just because we still talk pretty much on a daily basis. And um, yeah, I had to laugh just because I hadn't thought about that in so long. And the video I think was five years old and uh, it was just funny to be reminded of what I was like when I was in college. <laughs> well, so perhaps you still have some beatboxing in you. I, I don't even know. I haven't done it in so long. <laughs> you should consider flexing it or not flexing it, but maybe trying it out during warm-ups. Uh, since oh, yeah. uh, you, 
maybe yeah. d- during warm ups because that, that's your mellow time, if you will, as an official outside yeah. of the captain's meetings. Right. I still yeah. think you have it in you. <laughs> maybe get my my voice voice ready to make some calls and be vocal. That's how I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll do some beatboxing in the locker room. <laughs> yeah. Y- y- that's that's a good idea in the locker room with your fellow officials drop a few notes drop a few bars and see uh see where that leads you <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you were the first uh to list that as a fun fact and on a related notice area mm-hmm. uh, you might remember this question actually uh from the guidebooks that get published but mm-hmm. even if you whether or not you can beatbox i still think you can but we'll save that for another story uh what is an unusual thing about yourself that people wouldn't know about you if they met you for the first time? Just a a fact or a hobby interest, something that people wouldn't necessarily expect out of you. I'm trying to think, hmm, like what's an unusual? I feel like I'm pretty boring. Um, yeah, I feel <laughs> boring after we just went on about this beatboxing <laughs> career, I'm this pretty... beatboxing track of yours. Yeah, boring. Uh, I'm Azaria, you're selling yourself short. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think like what's something people would know about me. Um, ah, oh, that's a tough one. Just because I feel like people know a lot about me, being a ref, being a former basketball player. Um, I'm trying to think of like another talent well I mean people don't know it's I guess it's not unusual but a lot of people don't actually know what I do um for my day job and um I mean I've told some people but they don't yeah so basically what I do for my day job is I'm a dietetic intern and so the best way I explain that is it's basically residency for people who want to be a dietitian so I'm definitely a foodie, uh, love cooking. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get to do it as much during the season just because I'm coming home from work, um, going to go rough games. But I would say I, I love, love cooking and love trying out new recipes. So I guess that would be something people don't know. I'm glad we were able to work our way to an answer, Zaria, because you are not boring. <laughs> um, I would throw in there, I'm always the person who's going to order the weird thing on the menu. Like, give, give me the snail, give me the calamari, you know, give me, you know, all the, the weird exotic things. That's me. All right. Well, depending on who watches this, uh, you might either gain some uh, <laughs> a fellow uh, culinary enthusiast or you might lose some uh, restaurant buddies. I'm not sure which yeah. way it will go yet. <laughs> uh, on the recipe side, though, is there uh, uh, what are some dishes that you've uh, enjoyed? Maybe some of your favorite foods that you like to create. And I'm with you. I enjoy it. It's just so difficult because I'm usually busy prepping for my game assignments and in some cases I'm prepping for a marathon of them but yeah. what are some favorite foods you like to concoct uh I would say I haven't made these in a while but tacos because you can do so many different things you can do shrimp taco fish beef chicken I like foods where it has different avenues so tacos omelets I've made omelets a lot you can do so many different things. Have veggies in there, some meat. Um, have you burgers. considered Have you considered snail omelets or tacos? No, I have not. I have not. Um, I don't even know where I would buy snail. To be honest, um, I'm messing with you. You were saying yeah. burgers, another one. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, burgers is another one because again, that there's so many different ways you can go with a burger. You could do turkey burger. You can do beef. I've even seen a shrimp burger. Like, it's just, I like foods where there's not one way to make it. That is a good way of looking at it. And actually I have a friend of mine who said she could eat tacos every day and it wouldn't bother her a bit. I might have to get the two of you connected. (laughs) 
the possibilities will be endless. Yeah. <laughs> So I know we've talked for a good while about your officiating career and how that is just beginning for you, but let's not forget you were a college player as well and got to experience a lot as an athlete. So throughout your time, what would you say was the most exciting moment and your most embarrassing moment as an athlete? Exciting, I would say, uh, so my senior year of, of college, we made it to the tournament. So that was really, really exciting. We got knocked out the first round, but just being able to experience the tournament, that definitely is up there. And then for high school, of course, state. Um, embarrassing. Oh, this is so embarrassing. So because I wore braids um, some and like how they were kind of braided in my head, uh, sometimes they would get loose. And, you know, you'd be running down the court and you find a, find a braid on the court. Um, and I think that's happened more than once. So that definitely would be embarrassing because you got to hurry up and pick it up off the court. So that probably would be my most embarrassing. I mean, I don't have to worry about that now. Um, but when I wore braids, yeah, that definitely happened more than once, more times, and I would like to admit. <laughs> and I'm wondering if that is why you decided to cut your hair <laughs> once you were done as a player. Like, how do I make sure this doesn't happen again? Yeah, I'm yeah. done with the braids. Yes, yes. <laughs> I can't handle seeing them fall on the floor again and have to like, oh, what's this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. I'll never know that experience. I was not blessed with good hair genes, but I'll take your word for it, Azaria. And uh, uh, you, I'm sure you and fellow players could get into a lot when it comes to managing hair as an athlete. And we probably would need an entirely new podcast to pull that off. But you know, that that is, uh, like I said, something that I wouldn't have to worry about, but I could imagine as a player, you're like, oh, what the yeah yeah very embarrassing <laughs> you want know though i'd like to think they fell off because you put in the work it wasn't because of anything right. you did they just fell off because you were falling so hard that they, right. they couldn't keep we'll up with, with you yep we'll go with that <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, see, you were just that intense of an athlete yes. that it was like if you're not with me then get off that bus or get yes off <laughs> yes get off this station oh I, I'm turning this into a tangent. <laughs> well, throughout everything you've experienced as an athlete, as an official, and who knows what will come your way as you continue living out this dream of participating in this sport that was always on at your household. If you were playing it, it was always on television, et cetera. But mm -hmm. with everything you've experienced, what would you tell a younger version of yourself? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I would say be confident. And I still have to tell myself that um, it's just because sometimes I think I know less than what I actually know, um, whether that's in my day job, whether that's officiating. So I would say be confident and because you know more than you think you do. It's just you've got to believe that you know it and then it's going to come out when it needs to. I think that's a good way of looking at it. And Azaria, as you and I spoke, well, you did answer one of my thoughts was, wait, how did she end up at Minnesota? It was to get your master's. <laughs> because clearly the bachelor's or all the other flexes you made in your career weren't enough. You just had to go get that. No, that actually is a <laughs> uh, It is a distinguished honor to continue that path. And you mentioned working as a dietitian. Diet a, yeah, so it's a dietetic intern. Dietetic. So I've never yep. heard that word before. So yeah, so it's the exact same thing as residency for med students, but for dietitians. So is that something you see yourself doing? Because I think you were talking yep. about how few people know about your day job and this degree of yours. It's like, yeah, we we've talked about your exploits in basketball. I totally forgot that. 
you have this other path of yours. So, <laughs> it, so in human health, so yeah, I guess what invigorates you about the field of medicine and specifically being a dietetic diet. <laughs> uh, I, I'm like, am I framing it right? Yeah. So, I've never had to think about it though. I didn't yeah. even know there was a word until just now. Yeah. Um, honestly, and this is going to sound funny, but I love food. And why is that me- funny? You, you kind of stated that a while ago with your cooking. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, I love food and there's so many misconceptions about food and being able to educate people on how food can be used as medicine. And I think that's what invigorates me. Um, just like in the rotation I'm in now, it's diabetes and people think if they have diabetes that they should restrict carbs and it's actually the opposite. So just being able to properly educate people on food and what it can do for your body, just because there's so much junk out there in regards to nutrition and food and people make it seem like everything is bad for you. And in reality, there aren't any good foods or bad foods. It's just a matter of how much of a food are you having? And that's where you're getting into some, some muddy waters. Well, if I ever visit your household, this area, uh, I'm going to prepare myself because chances are you'll probably throw some recipe that I've never seen coming. <laughs> <laughs> but what I enjoy about it is along the lines of why I enjoy my career in media, whether it's a broadcaster or video production, that's another strong suit of mine. Mm-hmm. You get to make something out of nothing. Right. When I cover games, I may not do as many for my channel now that I'm involved with other stations, but I get to create the world that I want. And Mm -hmm. for me, a lot of this was self-taught. I didn't go through the motions and there wasn't a whole lot of options for college students at the time I was attending. Mm -hmm. I'm a fellow gopher, by the way. I got my bachelor's from there. I don't have a master's though, so you have that on me. (laughs) Uh, But... If you think your fascination with food is weird, I tell this and I get reactions that kind of run the gamut. Most of my close friends know of this. I have a photographic memory of fonts. Oh, wow. If you were to watch a game or watch any of the stuff that I've done this past season, you'll notice that I can recreate entire templates from network sports broadcasts going back to the 80s. Wow. Okay. I'm pretty sure you have not met anyone else who has that talent. I have not. No. <laughs> you see, at least with food, there are fellow culinary enthusiasts out there that you can mingle yeah. with and connect with. Uh, my talent is a little more specific. Yeah. So you, you think you're weird. I'm like, yeah, this is what I do. I study fonts <laughs> when I have no reason to. So if you were to go to my channel, you'll notice that I recreated the ESPN college basketball score bug and template. Oh, okay. Or, or, some, or at least something similar. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, this is probably why I am not on ESPN myself. <laughs> <laughs> probably why I'm still, no, no, no. Just, I was always fascinated by it. And it's always kind of cool to see how all the graphics come together and what templates yeah. work, what looks how they've evolved too over time. We've talked about the game, how broadcasting has evolved and all the information. So yeah, I I think of the, between the two of us, I have the weirder talent. Okay. You might see it differently and that's fine, but I'm (laughs) like, I think I could one up you there. Yeah. So don't, in case you ever feel weird, just remember, you know, a guy who studies fonts for a living. Okay. In a spare time. (laughs) But it really is fascinating to find all these different avenues about you. And I think what I love most about what I've done is getting to reconnect with people like you, Azaria, and learning that you were a talented basketball player, but you found a couple of different paths that you enjoy staying involved in the game through officiating what began as an intramural deal, turning into something bigger where now you get to go. And like you said, you're getting paid to cover basketball. Right. 
that that's a pretty sweet gig. And I don't know where your dietitian career or dietetic career will lead you, but you have a passion for that and using it as a tool to teach others about managing themselves and the, some of the misconceptions that come with it. So uh, it, there are all these different things that I just find fascinating. And I wish we had maybe a little more time because you're speaking of all these different pieces that make you who you are. And I'm glad we really had this conversation. I'm not sure what else there is about your story that you'd like to share. You've touched on a lot, but it's really cool that we were able to get this opportunity to showcase what makes you who you are, not just as an official, but everything else that makes you you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me on, Mike. I I didn't get into officiating to get any type of notoriety, but when you get highlighted, it's always a good feeling. So thank you for having me on. So Azaria Jackson, you'll see her on the court. I don't know when, but you'll <laughs> see her sometime in AAU, and hopefully you'll see her again next season. Once again, Benel St. Margaret's Emory University graduate, master's degree. The list goes on, and it's just getting started for Azaria and plenty of others like her. And if you have a story you'd like to share, whether you're an official coach, player, or have something you'd like to add to this basketball community, just contact us at the Mike Beaton on social media. If you've got a story, we're happy to share it. So until next time, thanks for watching. If you'd like to support TSB television programming, sponsor us at patreon.com slash TSB television, PayPal at TSB television, or cash app at TSB television. Thank you for listening to Mike Up Sports.